Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar-chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. Sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Widely known for his appearance as a finalist on NBC's The Voice, which just happens to be one of my wife's favorite shows to watch. Actor and producer Tony Vincent has spent the last 22 years of his career operating out of New York City. In 1993, Vincent started his own record company, Adobe Flats, writing and producing the EP Love Falling Down that led to a recording contract with EMI Records. The two solo albums that followed... Tony Vincent and One Deed produced six number one Billboard radio singles. In 1997, Vincent took a detour into rock-based theater, starring in uh, on Broadway in Rent, Mark and Roger, Jesus Christ Superstar as Judas Iscariot, and Green Day's American Idiot, St. Jimmy, played Simon Zealots in Andrew Lloyd Webber's film remake of Jesus Christ Superstar, and is also featured in the film Andrew Lloyd Webber Masterpiece. Vincent originated the role of Galileo Figaro in the rock band Queen's We Will Rock You on London's West End and opened the U.S. production in 2004. He has also fronted the band multiple times, including an epic performance of Bohemian Rhapsody for Queen Elizabeth II, with a live audience of over one million people surrounding Buckingham Palace. Vincent independently released two more albums, A Better Way, produced by Adam Anders of Glee in 2008, and the self-produced In My Head in 2012, following his showing on The Voice. Tony Vincent is currently headlighting the International Symphony Tour of the music of David Bowie and is writing and producing out of his newly relocated studio, Sound Shop 370 in Nashville, Tennessee. Tony, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thank you, Bob. That's quite the bio. (laughs) So first question I have to ask, what was it like to be on The Voice? Nerve-wracking. Yeah. You know, this was just the second season that that show was in the works. And so they were kind of just getting their feet stable. I don't think they knew exactly what they were were doing. So it was, there was a lot of of immediate camaraderie because everybody felt like this was incredibly exciting. Not that it was just a brand new show, but it was, we're all kind of figuring this out as we went. Um, You know, there were a lot of really, really talented people that were already doing music. You know, I had already come to the show with with two major label record deals and a lot of the people that were on the show had substantial careers beforehand you know so it was more like just a bunch of of friends kind of getting together and and hanging out it was good was coming on the show just was it something i mean obviously you already had you had a career established Mm -hmm. you were out there working what was your goal for being on the voice sure i think i came to a realization after doing music professionally for for 20 years that unless you're willing to kind of play that that social media, you know, high profile TV outlet, you're really minimizing the opportunity to really make an impact in a massive way. And and I don't like to do things small or halfway. And I think that was the only reason that I entertained the idea of doing the voice. A because I thought it was, you know, it was in my opinion still is the real credible show, you know, because there is no Literally, your your vocal chops are what get you to continue to move ahead in that show, at least initially. You know, I think that that's, there's something that could be said for that. Let's back up a moment. Sure. Getting on to The Voice, uh, we watch a lot of these shows, America's Got Talent, mm-hmm. American Idol, sure. uh, The Voice. And you hear about the cattle calls. Yeah. That is, you know, tens of thousands of people lining up in auditoriums hoping to get the chance, and many yeah. of them don't. Yeah. Where did you start in this process? Because sure. I, I do know there's there are 
people out there seeking talent. Well, I, I'm not going to you know, mislead here. I was actually approached by three different individuals, two attorneys and someone actually who worked for Universal Music, who owns essentially that show and the catalog of music that comes out of that show. They do want this to be good television. You know, I think unlike... You know, American Idol, which those initial shows, I mean, a lot of people tune in for the embarrassing factor of what those young people kind of do to themselves in in spite of probably, you know, taking advice from a parent of of not doing it, perhaps. But nonetheless, I think that, you know, because three people kind of encouraged me to do it, I, I actually did get a proper audition slot. So I did have to audition just like everybody else who stood in a, you know, a cattle call line. But it wasn't, I didn't have to do the, the line stand per se. But I did have to go through all of the, the hoops that everybody else did. Sure. And you wound up on CeeLo's team. I did. How was he to work with? Great. However, uh, I'm actually a year older than CeeLo. When we started to get to know each other really fast, we figured that we had so many common relationships within the music industry already, it was like we became very fast friends. And that doesn't make good television. And that's not what NBC wanted to have happen at all. So, you know, we were talking, me and CeeLo and Babyface were talking just like we would if we would hang out at a pub or a bar. And so we're talking like, what's our favorite winery? Have you been there? You know, let me get this bottle for you. And this is kind of thing. And so the the producers of that show were like, you guys can't talk to each other this way. So I think that's, I think his hand was a little pushed to, to show me the door sooner than he would have rather yeah. had done. And then you went on to be on quite a bit of stage shows in Broadway. That's a little bit of a different turn for most people, especially if they're in the music business or mm-hmm. the rock and roll world. Is that something also that was, was it on your punch list to do or was it, no. was it an opportunity that fell into place? You know, there's, I think, a, a stigma of if you're a musician or a songwriter, you can't be an actor or you lose like artistic credibility and vice versa. What's funny, I think, is that like all Hollywood actors want to be rock stars and all rock stars want to be actors. (laughs) But that being said, I had actually spent about 15 years on Broadway before I had ever entertained the idea of doing The Voice. And that was strictly because I thought The Voice could move me back to being an artist, move me out of the Broadway stigma because I had such a significant sort of thumbprint on that industry because of I was doing some really innovative, you know, being a part of some pretty innovative shows, some stuff that was pretty cutting edge. I mean, American Idiot was really one of the most breathtaking things I've, I've ever been a part of visually. And it really challenged the entire Broadway climate of what was accessible on that stage and what was not. Did you have stage experience leading up to that? Is that something you did in school? I did. When I was really, really young, I don't know if this was a very conscious decision or not, but I tried to use every performing outlet that I could. So whether I was in a choir or whether I was in Battle of the Bands or I was writing songs out of my bedroom in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I used every opportunity to perform to be a better communicator. Whether I really understood that at that time or not, that's really kind of why I think I've made these sort of pseudo seamless crossovers between, you know, being an actor on a Broadway stage or doing a performance on The Voice or working with Queen and fronting them on on many occasions, you know. So I think I've been able to wear a lot of hats because I didn't limit myself for what I was supposed to do at a young age, if that makes sense. As a kid growing up musically, who were your influences? My dad had a really great record collection when I was growing up. And I remember when I was four years old, I heard a Beatles record and it really changed my life. I mean, it, all I knew at that time was that whatever was coming out of those speakers, I wanted to be a part of. I didn't know what that was. I knew that I loved drums. I loved the sound of them. I knew that I could sing before I could speak. Um, and my family knew that too. So I was always really, really supported by my folks. But it was it was the Beatles. And then I started playing drums when I was about seven years old. And then about the age of 12 or 13, a friend of mine, and again, this is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I grew up, brought a synthesizer over. And it set me on this trajectory of really just loving synthesizers and programming and synthesis and sound creation and sound manipulation and what did that mean? And so I was I was doing stuff that none of my friends were doing growing up. People had guitars and I had synthesizers and samplers and I was listening to The Cure and Depeche Mode and Kraftwerk and these sort of bands that were, you know, very 
either English or German, and that's what was moving me. That's what felt incredibly, I don't know, it just resonated within me more than, than any other type of music that was coming out of America, per se. At what age did you decide you were going to make this a career, or did it fall into <laughs> play? <Four>? Were you... <laughs> so you really weren't thinking of doing anything else. There never. Was, there was never, never any other plans. No. Although I did go to school to study music business, I think that sort of ticked the box of, of my father's, like, look, I know you're passionate about this. I know you're really talented in this, but just in case, you might want something to support another type of career path. Funny, it was was in Nashville where I was studying, and I wound up getting a record deal, which pulled me out of university my second year. So, yeah, I really uh, had only one focus from a very young age. We're going to take a break, get a word in for a couple of our sponsors. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about that role that you played with the We Will Rock You on London's West End, and then, of course, Queen, and and the live performance in front of Queen Elizabeth and a a million of her closest friends. (laughs) In the studio with us today, Tony Vincent. Hi, this is Bill Sinke. You've probably never heard of me, but you've heard of the business side of music. Good thing. Listen on. You're listening to the business side of music. Nashville Zoo comes to life at night with magical glowing animals, gigantic flower gardens, colossal Chinese figures, and a 200-foot-long dragon. It's Zoo Illumination, Chinese Festival of Lights. Meet Santa in a two-story holiday village with a towering Christmas tree and giant train. More than 500 lanterns spread across the zoo, making this the largest lantern event in the country. Come experience this 800-year-old tradition. Zoo Illumination, November 15th through February 2nd. Learn more at NashvilleZoo.org. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics. All written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Back in the studio... You're listening to another edition of The Business Side of Music here in Nashville, Tennessee. Tony Vincent is sitting across the table from us here. Thanks for being on the show, first My of pleasure. all. You had an opportunity I think a lot of people maybe, A, wouldn't even believe existed yeah. or comprehend, uh, the role of Galileo Figaro, which is yeah. not the easiest thing to say. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about that that show as it was. Sure. So actually, I was I was signed to a record deal with Sony, technically with with Epic Records, and I was in London doing some songwriting. And because I had a history of being in in rock musicals, I get a call from a booking agent in New York City saying, you know, Queen is doing this musical called We Will Rock You. Would you be interested in auditioning? We're taking video submissions because supposedly they had been looking for the lead role in and around England, and I think they even went to to Scotland to look for an actor who could sing Freddie Mercury-esque. And I don't mean try to emulate what Freddie does, but kind of have his type of range. And they just couldn't find anybody. And so they opened it up to an American casting agent named Bernie Telsey out of New York City. I actually happened to be in London at the time where everybody else was doing video submissions and sending it into the band. I was like, you know what? I'm here. So if it makes sense and they have, you know, an opening... Let's let's do it now. So I remember auditioning for them about three days before Christmas one year and getting a call back 
And then on Boxing Day, which is the day after Christmas, literally the city kind of shuts down. I don't even think the tube operates. So I got, I got a car service to take me to this rehearsal space. And, you know, Roger is a little bleary eyed. Roger Taylor, the drummer, um, who still lives a pretty aggressive rock and roll lifestyle. And Brian May shows up and the music director of that show. And then the uh, to be co-star I wound up singing with that day. I literally was on my way to Heathrow. I had my guitar and my bags packed. I showed up at this, this call back, and then I went back to New York. And in about four days, I got a call that I'm moving to London. Wow. How long were you there? I was there for about a little over two years. The show took about um, maybe four months, five months of rehearsal and a that lot of long. rewrites. Yeah, because they, although they had a director, there was a little bit of sort of a, a, t- a touch-and-go situation where the actual writer of the show, actual really talented author named Ben Elton, who was a writer on a, a huge British show called The Black Adder and then has a huge, his own book career as well, wound up writing the book. And so he actually went and replaced the initial director at that time. So it was, it was a little odd, you know, and kind of sticky. It was four or five months, but it wound up being sort of a cheeky musical with some ridiculously epic pop and rock songs. Let's talk about the performance of Bohemian Rhapsody in front of Queen Elizabeth and, as I said, a live audience of over a million people. The show, when we opened it, got killed by the critics. They absolutely hated that show. Now, the average consumer, the punter, loved the show. So what Queen decided to do to kind of go against the machine of of newspaper critics, etc., is oh, you don't, you think that this is going to like be, you know, the end all of our musical here? Uh, How wrong you are. So they took me to front them on several benefit shows, whether it was television, BBC performances. And then we uh, get an opportunity to sing for the 50th anniversary of Queen Elizabeth's on the throne party from Buckingham Palace. And so I'm sharing the stage with Ozzy Osbourne and Eric Clapton and the cores and Natalie and Brulia and I get to front Queen and I'm performing with, you know, Brian and Roger. And then on a second drum kit, out of, there's a video out there of the, of the performance. Phil Collins is on a second kit behind me. And, uh, and then I get to close the night singing Hey Jude with Paul McCartney, which was epically brilliant because I'm like, you know, for a four-year-old boy to hear and, and love music strictly because the Beatles birthed that in him, and then to find myself singing with them 30 years later was just almost, if, if this isn't happening, don't pinch me because I don't want to wake up. Was there any moment where you were like, oh my gosh, can I do this? I mean, was there, I remember, were you just, just ready to just take the stage by storm and, and hit it out of the park? You're playing with a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of legends that a, a lot of other musicians sure. hope to just meet, emulate, get a chance to perform with. You're with them all. I don't think I realized what it was in the moment. I think I was so focused on what the job was at hand, I wasn't swayed from going in there and just doing what I knew I could do. And then after the fact that it was over, oh my gosh, did that really happen? Did I just sing with Paul McCartney? They say there was a million people around Buckingham Palace, but what they didn't tell me until I found out afterwards was that 200 million people were watching that performance around the world live. So that, I'm glad I didn't know that beforehand, you know. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to take another little break. And when we come back, I want to talk about this current project you're working on, uh, the International Symphony Tour of the Music of David Bowie. Let's see where that's going to be taking you next. Sounds great. In the studio with us, Tony Vincent. What can I say? Rock and roller, stage actor, producer, singer, songwriter, finalist on The Voice here in the studio with us today. Hello, this is Michael Elsner with Master Music Licensing, and you're listening to another edition of The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Wow, I just joined the Music Starts Here community. This is a truly hidden gem for anyone in the music business. Whether you live in Nashville or anywhere else in the world, Music Starts Here is like a GPS for your music career. This is the place to be if you want to get advice and direction from some seriously talented musical people who have been where you want to go. Music news, events, and a great big community with resources for artists, songwriters, musicians, studio and tech, along with music business advice from pros in the industry, all on one site. Make sure you get your free profile now. 
go to www.musicstartshere.org. That's musicstartshere.org. Hi, this is Vinny Rebus, the founder of Indie Connect. Our goal is to ensure that you have the knowledge, the tools, skills, resources, and connections that you need to develop a profitable and long-lasting career in music. One way we do this is through these Business Side of Music podcasts. I'd also like to invite you to check out Indie Connect magazine, our free multimedia online publication packed with practical interviews and advice from music industry experts. Go to www.indieconnectmag.com. That's www.indieconnectmag.com. Let us walk with you and guide you every step of your musical journey. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, you're listening to another edition of the business side of music here in Nashville, Tennessee. The Symphony Tour of the music of David Bowie. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that production. What is sure. it about and where is it going? Yeah. So there, there's a company based out of Virginia Beach, Virginia, who does these symphonic pops shows. And they usually focus on artists who are either no longer with us or don't tour anymore. The gentleman who runs it, his name is Brent Havens. And I get a call from Brent from a recommendation who saw me in American Idiot. Uh, that was the, the Green Day show on Broadway. And Brent said, look, I have had a relationship with symphonies all over the country, and some are overseas. One of our conductors or uh, symphony managers just called me the day or or two after Bowie had died and said, do you have a David Bowie show? And smart as Brent is, he goes, absolutely I do. And wow. so the next six weeks, he works on arranging basically a 17 you know, song show that's focused on David Bowie music. And I go down or at down, I was living in New York at the time to Virginia beach and sing with a, a small band down there. And he's like, okay, you're our guy. So actually I've been doing this show for about a little over two years. I think we did 30 concerts with symphonies the first year alone. Are you picking up local symphonies in each market? Exactly. So yeah. like I actually did it with the Nashville Symphony. So what happens is we come in uh, with a four or five piece rock band, depending on on what the situation is. And, you know, the orchestra already has the music about two weeks before. We won a rehearsal from top to bottom the day of the show. Um, I fly in the day before. We do a rehearsal the day after. We do a show that night and then I go home the next day. Nice. It's pretty seamless. And it was... You know, we're dealing with, you know, when you're dealing with orchestras like the National Symphony or Atlanta or, you know, the many gifted symphonies around the country, you don't need a lot of rehearsal time. I try to just be as authentic as I can to the material. I don't emulate what Bowie does as much of an impact as he's had on my, you know, what I do on stage as a performer physically as well as vocally. I don't try to do what he would do. I just try to be as authentic to the material as I can. And I think that's what resonates with an audience because it's not a karaoke thing. It's not a, a tribute band to David Bowie. It's me singing David Bowie if I wrote those songs. But I, I have such a, a reverence to him as an artist. I just try to be as genuine as I can. Did you feel the same way when you were performing Freddie Mercury Queen? Yeah, I think so. In a, in a matter of speaking, I mean, I never, I, you know, there's only one Bowie. There's only one Freddie Mercury it would be the biggest mistake for someone to try to emulate what they, they do. I mean, the audience knows what they do. They know no one will replace those individuals. And so to try to, if you do what they do or try to do what they do, it can come off of nothing but comedic, in my opinion, and disingenuous. Yeah, and you also have to be true to yourself. Absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I was a, a songwriter and recording artist way before these experiences. So I had already found a certain amount of significance in what I did as a, as a person on stage. And you don't want to come across, as you said, uh, either uh, as a comedy or as a parody. Right. You're, right. you're there more than a singer. You're there to entertain. Yeah. And you're also there to really show how you felt about whether it's Bowie or it's Freddie Mercury sure. or whoever it is. And to pull that off, you have to have a certain amount. Of, well, you have to have a lot of sincerity when you walk on stage. Absolutely, because I'm sure that those people in the audience, I mean, if I, I think of, if I was in those seats watching a performer try to cover Bowie material, I would be skeptical beyond measure. And, you know, what I try to do is 
is join songs with these links of text of of something that they might not know historically about, you know, either what a genuine individual Bowie was or a certain of where he was in his career when he wrote this song or who he wrote it with or why did he write this? Because I'm a, a, such a lover of songwriting trivia, I think it brings a certain level of respect immediately because they know I'm not here to, to mess about. I'm trying to be as true as I can. What's next for Tony Vincent? You know, I just relocated back to Nashville this February. The big thing of of why I did this was to start a one-on-one artist development company for musical theater actors. I think that Broadway has never been bigger than it is now when when people are spending upwards of $2,000 to see Hamilton. Something is happening, and and the Broadway community will tell you this. Not only people on stage, but the people that are in the theaters, the people that are ushers, the people that are promoting theater. It has never been bigger than this, and it's no longer something to be ashamed of to to love musical theater. I mean, Hollywood people want to do it, and so kids in drama schools or even kids in just taking a drama class at a public high school are no longer shamed. I mean, this is a, this is a really vibrant area of entertainment. And so I met a gentleman who does one-on-one coaching with commercial music talent. So young people who whose parents really believe in what they want to do essentially join this company. And it is a one-on-one really self-designed curriculum that's based on what that individual needs. Sometimes it's a six-month course. Sometimes it's a 12-month course. Most of our talent, they come into Nashville for about a 72-hour period of time. Most of them live out of the city. Probably 80, 85% don't live in Nashville. And they come here and we really inject what we feel they need to make themselves a better artist, a better performer, a better communicator on stage. And I have a a focus on musical theater talent. And pretty intensive in in 72 hours trying to... Absolutely. They they come in and and I design exactly what they need to, to have take place. I have an amazing group of individuals who have either had Broadway experience or at least production contract on Broadway shows and that actually live here in Nashville. So I've really gathered some of the best actors and instructors to teach our young people. Where It doesn't matter where they're from, whether it's Virginia or Florida or New Mexico or California. How can people find you? at pcgtheatrical.com. It's as easy as that. There's, there's a lot of information on that website. You can also drop us an email and someone will reach out to you to, to kind of fill you in at a, at a much deeper level. Tony, thanks for being on the show. This it's was great. My, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Don't forget to check out our affiliates, including Lab Canna, fine hemp products since 2014. Click on their link on our website for more information and how to order their product line. Click on our website link to get a free digital copy of Larry Butler's new rule book for singers and songwriters, 101 Ways to Help Improve Your Chances of Success. Also, check out our other affiliate, Music Starts Here. You can find them at musicstartshere.org. Probably the best one-stop shop for the singer, songwriter, or aspiring musician who's relocating to Nashville or wants to. Last but not least, shameless plug for this podcast. Become a YouTube subscriber by going to the Business Side of Music page. You can hear all of our released episodes there. Also, check out our website at businesssideofmusic.com. Follow us on Facebook at the Business Side of Music podcast and on Twitter at bizsideofmusic. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan. 